the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spend a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live, it's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story, they were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, a group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everyone, I'm geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane Dupont of Hawaii Tracker. We're bringing you guys another Kilauea, Mauna Loa, and Samoa volcano update today on Thursday, September 15th, 2022. We're about two weeks ahead of the one-year milestone of Kilauea's current summit eruption. So we'll talk about that a little bit, we'll give you guys some um, longer time lapses, we'll give you guys some, some summaries of the stats and all that. We'll talk about what's happening right now, which is business as usual, the eruption's been pretty steady still. Of course, we'll discuss your questions and comments, so please get them in. Um, Dan will be collecting them and leading the discussion on the chat and also monitoring our uh, our feed. So if you have any issues with our audio or video, if we start hanging for any reason, just let us know and we'll see what we can do about that. Um, we have a, a, a small update on Pohiki. Uh, I'll give Dan a chance later on to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but otherwise, what have you got for us today, Dan? Would you like to... Yeah, sure. not a whole lot. I'll uh, save most of the Poiki stuff for later, but we finally got a good update on that one. A lot of the stuff that's been going around hasn't been that solid, but we got a little bit of sol uh, solidity here. Uh, but really, you know, it's uh, up at Kilauea. It's kind of the same old story at this point. You know, we're coming in on, what, about two weeks? Yeah, exactly two weeks until the anniversary of the eruption. And this point is there really anybody that's going to bet that it stops beforehand and if it did stop beforehand could you imagine the, the like uh, usgs prepping you know for the presentations like all right guys add a few more slides you know it just stopped you know but, <laughs> well, <laughs> but right funny. now that doesn't seem 
like it's the case. You know, I wonder what the Vegas odds would be on that. It, you know, well, it's funny uh, you should say that because if you we, 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 one thing that I'm, I'm leading with our title today is we have deflation going on now, which is a little different uh-oh. than we've had in a while. So we talked about we we looked at the GP, <laughs> GPS last week and saw some contraction at Kilo Waste event. We thought we better wait a little bit right. and see what's up with that and. We'll see. Uh, it's kept going for another week, and we will see that the tilt has also started to trend the other way. So I don't know. We'll throw a little, <laughs> little doubt in there just to make you guys watch All the play right. here. So yeah, but really, it's just minor minor changes. Nothing really major has changed. There's no increased threat. You know, everything is pretty much as usual. There's no no need for anyone to worry. That's the bottom line today. But so we'll look at the nuances and and go through all of that. So starting all off right. with Kilauea Dane, should I get into it here? Yeah, go ahead. All right, so Kilauea summary, and starting off with this image that Dane pulled from the KW camera from the 13th, two days ago on Tuesday, dawn shot, and a few less ooze-ups on this particular morning, but really nice dawn lighting, and you see the persistent lava lake right there, obviously, that red spot, which is now taking up less than 1% of that entire crested crater floor. So it's been a long journey to get here. We'll take you guys through it a little bit, but starting off with the mo- most recent last week, here is a KW camera. There's our circulating lava lake. We see one ooze up happening here in the south early on. There's another one that pops in over here in the northeast. Um, so really, there's there's activity across the whole the whole crust, um, but only in a few distinct places, right? So it's it's, it's covering all the way from this northeast to the southwest. But only in a few spots, and we'll we'll talk about um, the long-term pattern of ooze ups here shortly as well. But first, this last week, the ooze ups are still going on. Maybe not as many as we've had in the past, but they're still there on certain days if you could catch them if you're up up there in a national park viewing. So that's the the short version of what's happened this past week. We'll go into the details here. Uh, live view from the KW camera from a couple hours ago, and. It's been foggy and rainy, and so the, the fumes have obstructed some of these views today, given some funny captures. But here is a, the current look, look in, and you can see lots of this fume coming up and likely steam as well in there. So move into the S1 camera. Here's a last week once again. And reverse angle. So here is that southwest ooze up that just popped up. And I think the other one is off the screen to the, to the right over here, so we don't really see it. Um, otherwise, just a persistently circulating and open lava lake here in the center. The west vent continues to glow as the brightest spot. The second brightest spot is actually over here on the right. It's just uh, to the east of this main central island. Right? It's not so central as it used to be, but this what we just call a big island, and the central island is what's left of it's here. It's been lapped onto it, which is to say that the bottom edges of it have been covered by lava that's overflowed from the from through the crust and from the lake. So not as much of it sticking out as before, but there it is. And over here, just to the east of it, there's this open spot, apparently, that's been glowing quite a bit. It's visible in all the cameras. It's not the only one. There's another little glowing spot right there, right on that edge of the island. There's one up here at the north edge of this crust over here. Um, this is close to that old north vent from that first phase of eruption back in 2021, uh, 2020 to 21. And down here south in this fuming spot, you also see a little bit of a glow. And that's apart from the southeast pit, which is actually connected to the main lake through, through a little lava tube right through there. So it's pretty much the same as we've been seeing for a while, which is why we'll move through these and talk about some of the longer term patterns here. There's an F1 camera for the last week, and steady as she goes. There's a lava lake, the pit, a little hint of ooze up there. You see a little one over here, but not a whole lot hap- happening on this camera. It does uh, freeze a little bit there, but um, we see some overturning effects from earlier in the week here. Zooming into it to maybe get a little better view, we've looked at this before, the variation at a lava level. It's fairly steady. It's hard to tell a whole lot of visible change within a small scale right in there of that little purple zone, which is that that heated cliff that's uh, that, that the edge of that pond, right? So the lava is inset within that little feature there. And it, it lights up with the heat there. So you, when the lava level comes all the way up and overflows, you can see that by the change in the color and likewise when it drops back down as well. But we're not seeing so much of that. It, it, it is happening apparently to a small degree based on the monitors, but it's not uh, enough to really lead to any visible change in the lava surface here. 
So the current view of F1, this is a little earlier in the day. And let me reload it here and give her more current, a little bit of glow here from the west vent. And otherwise, it's once again business as usual. Okay. Live looking at the S1, pretty fumy earlier today. And just like to check because sometimes it has happened in the past where we talk and something changes as we're going along. So that's the most exciting thing that can happen. So we'll keep, keep looking just in case. Here's a V1. So looking closer in and you can see the pattern of flow. There's a big sheet moving that way from the exit point here. And there is a exit point. Um, out of this lake uh, through that lava tube into the southeast pit here and once again in the east and in the northeast over here. So we'll look at, there's actually a, a few more photographs and focus on this northeast section, maybe one, one more photograph that we'll look at, um, but that's an area that's been spattering quite a lot recently um, as well as a cont continuing spattering that happens over here in this east and south edge. So um, we'll show you guys uh, the photographs, um, but this is happening all the time. We've showed you guys videos before from Two Pineapples and We'll show you a little bit more again of that again today. But it's basically the same as before there. Here's the last week. And you can not exactly see the main motion because we're speeding it up so fast. But we're looking for these big term, bigger changes. And you really don't see a whole lot. If I zoom it in perhaps a little more, you can. it's, it's a little difficult with this camera because the, it seems like the camera itself must move on a tripod or with the temperature or the wind or something. So it wiggles a little bit hard to kind of keep track, but when you zoom in and look closely, you maybe can see a little bit of variation in the lava level. Not a whole lot, maybe, you know, a few pixels right on the edge right in there. But pretty steady as well. All right, and here is our media. So um, September 9th, here is an um, a image from the USGS taken of that spatter. So let me put our media of the week title on a screen here. I'm going to go through a few of these images and a few bonus ones I pulled from the archive as well. And there is one of those spatter bursts. Right? There is the lava comes to that little uh, inlet almost, right? That, that northeast edge of that pond and it's sinking back down under the crust there. But all the gas that's in the lava uh, doesn't want to take that route straight down, right? So it's going to essentially detach and come bubbling back up and create the spattering zone right in here. So it's a, like, a, like a, a, down, a downward motion that's causing this to happen there, and then the gas is escaping and separating and, and coming back up. So our caption, Field crews monitoring Kilauea Summit Lava Lake in Hale Mau'u'u'u, the morning of September 9th, 2022, observed sloshing on a northeast margin of the lake that produced spatter bursts pictured in this image. The spatter clots were thrown up to 10 meters, 33 feet, into the air before landing back on a lava, lava lake crust. USGS image by C. Parchetta. Awesome image. Thanks to the USGS for sharing that. Um, obviously, uh, uh, these images are, can sometimes be artistic. They're really, you know, really hard to capture um, either very clearly or with all the trails. So sometimes you get like some combination of seeing these nice... Uh, trails of the motion of the particle is getting shot outwards, right? When he's when he's slightly longer exposures, but then you do lose some of the resolution and sharpness here in the in actual red flow in the center. Oh no, but really uh, fantastic and um, love it as an artistic photo here. Uh, next, we'll see an image from September twelfth. And this is taken during the overflight that occurred earlier this week on Monday. So from that Monday flight as well. Uh, there it is. Aerial view of the lava lake, slightly higher angle. So we were looking at this this area right in here with a spatter sink right in there. And this is similar to, the, to that webcam view we were just looking at, and just slightly different angle there. See a little bit more sulfur here on this west vent complex patch, the lava tube that goes right through there. And if I advance this to the full scale image, then um, I can zoom in on it a little bit and see some of these features and one thing that's fascinating to me is this southeast pit here that at one point used to be attached all the way to this lake like that right um, but uh, since then it's been cut off crusted over and we still have this tunnel the lava has been moving through uh, into the pit but the pit itself it seems the lava, lava has been shrinking so now it seems like this is the open surface there which is smaller than it used to be which is smaller than it used to be so you're getting these kind of concentric patterns occurring in here 
and showing this uh, evolution and cresting over. So would not be surprising if at some point it actually crests over the whole way, you know, but uh, you might need uh, some more significant drop in the supply level, something to change it to give it a chance to do, to do that. Because as a hot lava keeps coming in, it just keeps re replenishing it and then causes the heat to cause it overturning, and that's what keeps it actually open and circulating. So, so um, we haven't seen many of those big drops in, in, in lava levels uh, like we saw before with the inflation inflation events. So just a note there. And here is the la uh, one last image here of the uh, summit area. And look at the caption first here. A panoramic image during an early morning uh, helicopter overflight on September 12th. Um, showing the current Haile Makamau Lava Lake at the summit of Kilauea. The blocks that dropped down during the 2018 summit collapse events are visible around the central lake. Sections of Critter Room Drive, which previously circumnavigated the caldera, can be seen on the left side of the image. The degassing occurs from numerous sources on the lake surface, including a main vent, several small tornadoes in the, in the front center, and around the margins of the cracks in the lake. So uh, let me zoom into it here, and we'll just kind of pan across here. So there it is on the left side. There is that edge of old crater rim drive there, truncated right there, and the other edge of it here, truncated. You can see a couple of pieces if I were to zoom it in more. Not sure how much I want to go into to lose my spot, but there's a couple of spot, a couple of pieces of road right in here as well. So. The road actually used to come like this and then connect like that, more or less. We're going to be hanging through the air, and there used to be a parking lot right in here. All that's down in this area right there now as a result of that collapse. So that's the, the remaining blocks here on the side. And looking at the back here, we see this is that southwest block. This is actually a down drop block over here as well. It's looking not so much like that because it's pretty even with the elevation we're seeing here on the actual crested lava lake. So more on that in a little bit here, um, but we'll come back to that southwest block here in a few minutes. Uh, but looking at the lake surface, putting it here front and center, it's really uh, striking how you can see this zone of fume and discoloration of these minerals and um, gas spots all around right in there. Right? You see how it's forming that nice oval right there. And that's the, the core of that old crust of the lava lake that's been rising buoyantly. And we had a question come in last week, which is still a, a unknown answer, right? But that's a good question. We'll repeat it here. Um, how come the lava is actually coming underneath that crest and pushing it up as opposed to just coming over it and filling it from above, right? And it has to do with buoyancy. Uh, it must, uh, that this, this central crust is more buoyant um, somehow than the lava that's coming in beneath it. And so a couple of things that could be contributing is the, the, the central island here, this uh, big island in the middle. From, uh, seems like it was formed originally during that first burst of lava back in December 2020. And that lava is really frothy. It's almost, almost like our Hawaiian version of pumice um, that is very, very light. And if that stuff got coated in a bunch of lava, you might have essentially a big, a big float in the middle of that thing. And that might be what's actually helping to keep it up right so that there's one that occurred with that original it used to be a north vent that where this came from um and then there was a a, a west a, a west vent um that occurred during that first phase of eruption which later ended up over here and then we had a new west vent which is the one we, we currently just, uh, refer to now which is the fuming spot right there close by as well so several different spots in here that, that might have some of that lighter material that could help it help it rise up and outbound of this crack is where it seems to be oozing out and filling in this area, as you imagine, just filling it from the top over and over and over. So it's interesting to see that that difference in behavior from the central image, uh, central area of the image to the outer edges here. And uh, all the gas is causing a lot, a lot of deposition of minerals, um, largely um, sulfur uh, minerals, sulfur sulfates, and you can see down in here, this little islet that we pointed out last week in one of the videos uh, has this nice, almost like a glaze on top of it of all this material, this white stuff on top of it there. So it's getting more and more coloration, more of this, more of this uh, appearance of different uh, mineral deposits all along the edges, which is pretty fascinating. And if I scan it over to the right, 
now you can see the boundary between that inner zone and the overflow, all the blacks up here is all the lava that's that's on that moat area, right, on outside of that central crusted core. And that's where it's filling in um, bottom up essentially, right? And overflowing onto these dendrop blocks. So maybe here you can see there's a little sliver of a block right in there that had slid down during a collapse, and there's another little sliver right in here. You can barely see the edge of it. It's mostly covered by the lava now. And there's another little sliver right in here. And you get the big cliff right up there. So if I zoom it out a little bit there, maybe you can get a little better view of that uh, stepping pattern there, right? So scroll it over a little more so you can see up here is Uekahuna. Former Jagger Museum and Volcanoes of Arturi facilities. That's where you can stand at the upper rim of the caldera, and you see these all these different levels of terraces of blocks that have sunk in different amounts into the crater. Not just in 2018, but um, all the way back to uh, five, six hundred years ago for this main caldera event up here. So, and that's that's uh, this is the old caldera floor right in here. And this is that down drop block to the east that we talk to talk about quite a lot. That's going to be that that bigger area to flood once we actually lap over this last little ramp right in here. So that's our panoramic view. And what I wanted to do is let's see, how I can make this look similar here. But we'll let's focus on this back block right here for now. This southwest block. So pretty even right here. And so to really illustrate how much it's filled in, I thought I'd pull up a couple images from the archive here. So let's start off going way back to, uh, this is from late 2018. This be a very similar view. And there you can see that whole block before any lava came in here. So this is the pit in the foreground that's all the way full of lava. And lava is almost up to this edge right in here. So right, so the current lava lake is, is really lapped on and you see it's, it's got this ear all the way up to here like that and over. So here's all the stuff that's buried in case you were, we were wondering, um, since we usually show it covered and we don't often show it what it looked like before, I thought I would um, refresh our minds here and give us a different view, different perspective, flip it around. Here is that southwest block and a, a more vertical view from the airplane. Um, this was a, a, one of the early flights I took with Scott Wilson following a collapse before the water even came into the bottom of the pit here. So, But it really shows you the depth of it right in there. And then this is all of that, that down drop block still over here. So the main cutter floor is still off the, off the screen to the left here. So we're going to include this time lapse that they put together. This is the B1 camera and this is now the last six months. So we will show you guys here the, this is a similar to what the US just put out a few months ago, but we've updated it. Mahalo Dane, awesome work. And you really see that pattern extended here of that whole crater floor being lifted. And so, as we discussed before, the area where these, these fuming hornitos are, these piles of spatter that are putting out the fume, that's what the hornito actually is there, is coming around the central, central crusted core that's lifting up. So you can see that that central area, if you focus on it, it seems to rise pretty steady every frame. Steady, 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 steady. But in contrast, this area in the foreground over here, it seems to kind of stick and then pop, and then stick and then pop, and stick and pop. So see the center is what's really driving it, and the edges are oozing out and filling in and oozing out and filling in, and really see the development of these cracks all through here and how everything kind of pops up. And it's interesting, we're going from a kind of a high angle to a low angle view here at the very end. We really see at the very, that very last frame, this part in here really pops up to the, to the, the foreground, pops up right here. So really cool stuff. Um, so that's the wide view. We can focus in back here. There is that, that West Vent area in the back. And here is our Southwest block right over there. Almost getting obstructed by the view now that the crater floor is rising to almost cover it. It's almost there. And of course, when we start to loop six months ago, you really can still see there's a lot of, a lot of cliff in that area still. Pretty fascinating, and I'm going to pan it over here to the right, so we can look at 
these down drop blocks getting flooded. So there you see a little bit of that edge of that sliver block, and here comes a flow up and up, and see it pops up in a minute, and then it just keeps encroaching and advancing over and over and over. Where that lighter brown color is not, no longer visible anymore. Well, now we only see this cliff up here, and we're starting to come up this steeper section. So it's really made quite a lot of progress in this northern section and has covered much of that down drop block area there. One view, that's the B1 in the last six months, and put that out in a different format coming up too. But we'll keep moving and show you guys the F1 camera. And now we're showing you time lapse for the whole eruption once again as well. So back from from not quite a year ago, a year minus two month, two weeks ago, and the whole pattern of eruption, I'll let it play through once, then I'll, I'll talk through what's going on here this next go around. So. Here it comes. That first first phase, you see a much larger lava lake. You see all this pulsing. You see the lava actually uh, coming all the way crusted over. And then really, in a more, more recent time, what you see is a, a smaller, more consistent lava lake, and you see ooze flows coming up all around. You don't really see the west vent bursting. You don't see any of these stopping and starting fits anymore. Um, you do see the lava level rising and falling early on in the sequence. Like right in here, you see it rising a bit. But that seems to slow down quite a bit, and at this speed, maybe you can also tell that while we're still having ooze up flows going on now at present, compared to before, they seem to be a little bit less. So keep your eye right here on how much it's flashing in the perimeter of the lake here. Like there's hardly a moment where you don't have something flashing at it sometime. Until around June, July, right in here, where we start having these gaps and occasional flashing of these ooze up flows in the perimeter. Yeah, so we're still having the ooze up flows, but maybe we're having a little less. It's uh, I haven't gone and actually counted them. This is just the the, the visual version of of, of it. So I think that's a fascinating thing to take note of there. One last time, and of course the lake closing in. That's something we saw during the last eruption, and not surprising to see it here. In fact, it's actually been fairly stable, the same shape for much of the last six months. It's fascinating there. All right, let's stop it there. So that was the, the media. And we'll do one more. And that's turning here to our updated map that we showed last week. But uh, we actually have a new map released this week with new volumes and uh, extent. So I thought I would update it and put it up for you guys one more time here. So we have data through September 12th. And really you can see uh, on this map the full extent all the way up to there and really covering, here's a little slivers of land I was, I was pointing out in the other view. They're all up here in the north, but really showing how it's advancing in this area. And we were focused on two zones in here, the southwest block. There's a southwest block right in there. See the flow advancing up that steep cliff and there's a little bit of flatness right in there, so it comes and it's going to take that. And it's getting up to right up this cliff, and at some point it's going to start advancing up. This is a little bit ramped as well, but it'll start moving up further and further that way too. So I'll come in and focus more on the north again. You can see the northeast started off and on its lowest spot and has turned and ridden its way up. And here in the northwest, is done a similar, but it's turning more to the nor northeast, something like that. And so it seems like as these two uh, cat years have been coming up, they're likely to uh, meet here in the middle as they come and flood this last piece of this down drop block right in here. So and then that'll be contained by this this uh, cliff right in here. And the next spot it can come out beyond that is going to be this way, right to there. And so that's what we're looking at. Um, we can make estimates based on the current effusion rates. Um, this is when I keep saying um, around Thanksgiving, by Thanksgiving, as I'm talking about this this phase right in here, it actually spilling onto this this down drop block because if I zoom it back out, you see once it gets on there, then it has all this flat spot. I can start coming across all through here and moving that way, and eventually it could cover a lot of this area. And of course, once it gets past this last lip, that's gonna it's gonna be the uh, growing its footprint, but it's going to be in this much larger area for a while. All the way to there and around. 
So um, that is the, the visuals we have today. Um, that does come from this uh, most recent map, which is part of the monitoring data. So we'll turn in, turn in into our monitoring discussion now, right? So here's that most recent map. And maybe if I zoom it in, you can see a little bit of this point of this out last week, this uh, little zigzag pattern, almost like a Christmas tree with little branches. It's, it's moving into these cracks of these little slivers in between them. And the same thing over here on a on the left. So this is where it's pinching together. And that should be covered in, in a few weeks, I would expect here. And then as we talked about, coming off in, this, in that direction. So notably, when you look at the at the boundary here on this eastern side you can see that it's 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 uh, much easier to advance in this northern section and further south you move you start to see some cliff so the land does rise in this direction over here so it's going to come up this way and eventually over top it and eventually it'll climb up this side as well but it'll, it'll likely have to wrap around for the most part here otherwise it's caught in there and our volumes at present the crater floor is at 2,907 feet above sea level, or 86 meters, which means it has risen in the last year 469 feet, or 143 meters. We'll go into this uh, in a little bit here, but first the numbers. Volume up to 29.2 billion gallons, that's 110.7 million cubic meters. And extent now, uh, it remains the same three acres, one hectare, out of the full extent of 294 acres or 119 hectares there. So that's where our less than 1% value comes in here. Right, so, so that is uh, where this map is leading us. So I see some, some um, questions about how deep things are coming in, but let me finish some of these graphics because I may, I may answer them with that first, and then we'll come in and revisit some of these questions here. Uh, so, um, but I do see one question here from Marin. The, do the ooze-outs happen when it pops up? Yeah, exactly. What we're seeing is that when the popping up is that ooze-up flow. It's just that we're playing the time lapse at such a speed that you don't see the thing oozing up. It just kind of comes out and is in place, and we just move on and on and on because it's the next day already. So that's the the just the one question we'll get get to right now. I'll, I'll, I'll come around to the other ones, but first let me look at this some of these numbers here. So here's our map of raw volume. We've looked at, looked at a few things. We've looked at the depth. We've, we're looking at the volume, and those are two different things to, to distinguish between. Um, so volume now, and our most recent volume, 110.7 million cubic meters at the right. You can see it's much more than the 41.2 we actually got from the prior eruption. You can see what it looked like when that one leveled off, and um, this slope of this line got pretty shallow right in there. And we've noted how our line up here on the right, the steepness of it indicates how fast it's it's uh, building in so you can see it sometimes it was faster and sometimes it was slower and then a little faster and a little slower and then we we're actually back to a little bit faster as we expected again and we discussed uh, in the last few weeks how this little little slower pattern was something that popped up during that different deflation inflation pattern that we saw and we saw that that ended and we expected to see a, a revision here coming upward so um, we do see that and we can take these numbers and we can put them in here. So I've updated this graphic uh, for you guys to help understand what's going on here. So we'll look at the depth first here on the left. And what we've drawn on here is on red 2020 to 2021. That's December 2020 to May 2021. And then in, in this uh, magenta color, we're looking at uh, September 2021 to present 2022. Right. So. This orange line up here is a previous profile of the caldera before the collapse of 2018. So the first thing that happened is 2018 collapse of 500 meters or 1,640 feet. That's that distance right there. Right. Of that, we have currently filled back in jointly 1,211 feet. Right. So as far as purely depth uh, goes, that's 74 percent of the way back up as far as depth of how far we collapsed before right so that's pretty striking you might think oh it's almost back to where it's before and and if you look at depth which is just a linear measure then yes that's true and to break it down a little bit uh, most of that 45 percent came during that first pulse of eruption back in 2020-21 and our more recent phase for the last year 
right, which is more than twice as long as that first phase. As brought it up, 143 meters, 469 feet, so uh, a lesser amount, 29% of that collapse volume. Um, but the reason being, the crater has this conical shape, and so it's got to spread out wider across here. And so even with more amount of lava, it doesn't pile up as thick. Right? So I'll scroll it this way. We can look at our volumes. Here is our 886 above sea level. Here is our eastern downdrop block where we've almost reached. That's our gap right there that we were just discussing, the overflow. And looking at volumes, here is how it breaks down. 2018 collapse was 800 million cubic meters, about 211 billion gallons. That first eruption last year, 41 million cubic meters or 11 billion gallons, 5% recovery of how much volume we lost, which is a lot. We, this was a huge, huge amount of lava that came out of the ground down in Lower Puna and a huge collapse at the summit, right? Not as big as it can yet, um, but still gigantic. And of that gigantic collapse, we refilled 5% in that first five month eruption. So within this last year, in total, this 29 million gallons that we've gotten, 111 million cubic meters, is amounts to 14% of what we lost in 2018. So taking them both together, that puts you at 19%, getting close to 20 maybe, right? But that's the range. We're about one-fifth of the way back full to what we lost in 2018, right? And we're talking about it's been um, four years, right? So in four years of refilling first underground for the first year, year and a half-ish, and since then above the ground um, with interruptions, uh, we've come 20% of the way, right? So if you're doing a very rough calculation there, you'd imagine it's going to take still many more years for it to uh, recover that loss. Right, and um, the question then, then, then becomes, well, when is it actually going to spill under here? When would it actually reach this level? When could it reach up to this level? And all that depends on it actually continuing for some amount of time without changing, which is highly unlikely. But for the purposes of helping understand what the rates are and how long these things take and how much space there is in there, we will go through the exercise as we usually do. So. To do that, we need to look at the actual volume rates, and so here is a, a compilation of all the intervals between every map. So we show you guys the time lapse of all those map frames and the map changing and the volumes changing every time they put out a new map. And between each of those maps, you can calculate the, the time that's taken, and you can calculate how much volume is different, and you can get, get a volume rate from that. So here is the big picture. Most of the lava came out at the fastest rate within those first two weeks of eruption, and really it crashed and has been in these low levels ever since. So really we're following that pattern of kind of um, bouncing around these steady low values um, for a while, right? That's, that's um, how it goes around here a lot of times, um, right? We can have eruptions that might last decades sometimes at low values, and uh, I refer to the pool oil phase of eruption, uh, era of eruption, when we did have similar similar to these values in the range of 3 to 4 cubic meters per second, so right in line to what we're seeing. Um, this is hard to see, so let's blow it up, and there it is, we'll crop the top off. But this shows you the smaller scale variations within the, the rates, and of course this depends a lot on when you release a map, and we're sampling a whole, you know, it's, it's drawn as, as individual points and lines really, but like really uh, an interval like this, or this data point really corresponds to this whole average period of time all through here and how that changed. You know, it could have done a lot more wiggles in between. So all that said, all those caveats said, um, here's what it looks like. We saw we've come up higher, we've recently bounced down. Last week we talked about it bouncing down again, but our most recent value is here at 2.9 on the right edge, or this right edge over here. So bouncing and so the fact you do have these two low values uh, maybe indicates that it's varying towards a lower amount perhaps you have to wait and see um, when we come back to this blue line the blue line is a last eruption the one that was five months and it's a different scale altogether right but you can see that after it came down and crashed it went down came back up it went down it came back up and then finally it went down to these under one cubic meter per second values so we haven't dropped that low yet but this bouncing around pattern is something that certainly um, is, is something we've seen before. So it could be bouncing around, and we'll see what actually happens here. We'll have to wait and see as usual, right? But uh, 
a little interesting to consider this in the context of seeing seeing some contraction and deflation at the summit, which we'll get to here very shortly. All right, so this map, uh, it's back from April 2021, but I pulled out because it has nicely drawn on here these contour lines, right? So this goes back to the uh, uh, before this eruption that we're currently in now, right? So this is what that last eruption crust ended up something like where the pink, pink amounts are. And they drew a green line for 800 meter contour. And we reached that uh, before the end of 2021, in fact. And they've drawn on here the purple as a 900 meter contour. That's what we're approaching now as the edge of that downdrop block. And so you can see there is that eastern downdrop block. And looking at this boundary over here in this northeast of the of the pit, you can see all this little variation right through there, right? So that that's telling you there's a lot of uh, low level topography through there. And lava is going to be meandering and oozing and fingering through that stuff all through here. So that'll be interesting to see as that happens on this upper ledge, right? Um, and you see that 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 will start lapping onto a little bit over here as well, but all this will be all covered um, when we get to that level. So down here in the southwest block, you see 900 meter contour actually pulls us up halfway onto the block, but not quite all the way to the back quite yet. And it takes a little more to get all the way to the to the top of that. So that will take a little longer. It'll be riding up in this direction and in this direction at the same time. And then the next boundary, the blue line, that's at a 1,060 meters above sea level. That's the edge of the collapse of 2018, this downdrop block. And so that goes all the way to here. And you can see that's, that huge volume for it to get to that is something we'll calculate as well. But then that's the main cutter floor elsewhere here. Right? Now, it's not something we've, we've seen in this historical time, but if the lava were to fill all this pit up and then all this other stuff up all the way here elsewhere and fill this entire area all the way, then there is a low spot out in this direction to the southwest. And so people always ask, like, well, how much could it possibly ever fill before it were to spill out? And, you know, that's the answer just for just for completeness here. It would spill out in this direction were it to last long enough in the same place and fill everything up and actually be able to, to do that. But that seems highly unlikely. Right? But we will talk about that in our graph as well. So here is our projections, and we've revised this to use our 2.9 cubic meters per second rate for the last month-ish, right? And that's actually not too far from our previous guess. We're going with 3.0, 3.1. So it's even though the rates bounce around a lot, our, our projections have been um, fairly unaffected. Right? So let me zoom it in first so you guys can see what's going on down in here. And this is the raw depth of the crater and time going on this way. And so each of these tick marks is one year. So we've only come thus far from 2020 to not quite the end of 2022, right? Well, actually, this is six months in here, well, one year from here to here. So, yeah, my bad. So six months there. So here we are, not quite to the end of 2022, right in there. So the first eruption brought that major uh, filling quickly and then ended, and it actually sagged in a little bit before the next eruption came up. And let me scroll it up this way. So our current eruption is just this little window right in here. That's how far we how far we actually have data for is right there. And then everything to the right of here is a projection. Right? That's where we currently are. 886 and 900 is the uh, down drop block right in there. So and I've broken it down here, just like we did in the last graphic. How much it actually splits out to get to our 1,211 feet. Right. So with these current rates, down drop block projects right here before the end of 2023. And to get to 1060, which is caldera floor right in here, that would take until 2027. Right? For it to get to that southwest caldera rim, 2028, right in there. Right? Assuming nothing changes, highly unlikely. For it to reach the lake, the lake's high point, like the bottom of the previous high mountain mountain crater, it takes slightly less time, but that's we're still, still talking 2026 in there, right? So really this downdrop block that we're hitting hitting by the end of this year is a last milestone for a while. It's gonna be, be filling that area 
for between 2023 all the way to 2026 if it can nothing changes in the meantime and that's why we why this is noteworthy to talk about now when it's actually actually uh, coming up on us right presuming as dane said that the uh, eruption doesn't decide to play a trick on us and turn off here before it hits its one year mark all right so um so coming back to a couple of these questions, I uh, saw a question from Richard. Can we guess how deep the active lava lake is? And so um, the, I guess there's two answers, right? Um, I consider that whole pit to be the active lava lake. It's just got a crust in the very, very top. So in that, in that case, I say it's 1,211 feet deep or so, right? Now, of course, against the actual crater walls, it's probably cooling and forming some kind of uh, a crust on the side. So maybe not quite that much. Um, but it's not cool. It's not like a very, very tiny amount either, right? It's it's probably cooled in there by some number of feet, but not enough to make a huge, huge difference, I would imagine. So that's that's the one one version of the answer. The other version of the answer could be you could consider that the active lava lake maybe is just just a part that's open where the lava is coming up and circulating and going back down. Now that's a great question that I really have no no clue or answer to, right? What we do see, is, we did see before. When the lava level was were to the lava rate dropped enough that the whole thing seemed to freeze entirely, so it doesn't seem to be connected straight up and down. I mean, it doesn't like doesn't it can't just sink straight down back and through the crust to where it was. It has to go through those pathways, those sinks that are on the east, northeast, and southeast. Um, so I would imagine that that active surface lake from what we saw in the past. I want to say it was something like 20, 30 meters. So you're looking at 60 ish feet, something like that, you know, before we saw the lava cooling and changing. So, you know, that's, that's a ballpark. It could be 40, it could be a hundred, you know, um, but ballpark, something like that. But I, I would be surprised if there's not that layer of crust beneath that area as well. Right. And we don't see any inter interaction coming into the lake from anywhere except that West vent area on the West side. So that seems to be the only place where it's coming up from below and in. And elsewhere, it's going to go across the top and then back down on the other side. So um, hopefully, whichever version of the question you meant, Richard, hopefully that, that answered it. Um, let's see. Another question. Uh, another, another one from Richard here. Could the weight of the lava building up on the top of the blocks push them down and choke off the magma vent? That's, that's a good question. Um, for a long time, we've been talking about how there really wasn't enough lava on top to really change things considerably below but it's adding up <clears throat> adding up more and more every week there so at one thing that came to mind for me was you know maybe not maybe not so much just purely the weight of the magma itself but also its interaction with all those slivers of blocks that are all different pieces of collapse within the crater right so the magma had to find some pathway up through those blocks to come out and form its original fissure. And perhaps as you're filling this cone in the center, you could be pushing on those blocks outwards a little more, right? And kind of packing in that, that crater. And maybe, and maybe that can affect some of the pathways deeper down. Perhaps. Um, I haven't seen anything that would lead me to believe that it, that, that is happening. Um, but it certainly is possible. And maybe if you were to need an explanation, um, you could consider that as a, as a for something fun funky happening, that could be something you might, you might bring into the fold to consider there. But um, one other thing that we haven't seen happen yet, but we've read about in the past, is as that thing comes up and as it tilts and moves, some of those other blocks could also get get dislodged and collapse back into the crater and collapse onto the lake surface. And we really haven't seen any collapses yet. Um, but the fact that that happened in the past um, would also indicate that 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 smaller scale stuff can can occur right um now the last thing to say is that the vent coming into the lake itself right now the one that's the main vent feeding that west vent area is already below the crust and is already below a whole bunch of lava or magma depending how you think of it on there so uh, it already has a bunch of stuff that it's pushing up and through and um it doesn't seem to have been enough so far however a reminder that uh if you followed us during an eruption from 2020 to 2021 that ended in May 2021, we essentially documented how 
the lava level as it rose seemed to have drowned that vent and eventually did shut it off perhaps because of that pressure blocking it off and you know that lasted a few months before it found a new pathway up and here we are still going a whole year later um so that could be like a short-term change that might cause it to rearrange its pathways that kind of thing could happen as well but I find it hard to believe that it could actually stop the entire process altogether, right? It might, might force it to rearrange or redirect or something like that. But um, if that were the case, and you'd, you'd see that in the monitoring data as well. So since that's really the, the clue to what's going on, we can look at that a little more closely here. And um, here is a plot of cement lava depth from September to now. So this is just that, that one little section that I highlighted that's we have data for and so this is just the lava laser level measurement similar to that volume measurement but not or depth measurement not the same um and by the way these measurements come from taking this topography and calculating the volumes from the dems to then arrive at actual uh, elevations and depths right? that's that's how that that's put together in case you're wondering so back to just the, the depth now, which is the easiest thing to measure report. There is that labor lava level, laser lava level, and coming up steady and uh, really not a lot of detail visible in there. Um, this is a year plot. And then one year of GPS, similarly, here is the extension north to south across the caldera prior to the eruption. And then the eruption beginning, relieving that pressure. And we actually had um, a little bit of inflation, a little bit of deflation, and then we've had small inflation and deflations, but overall, overall a pattern of, of inflation here, of spreading, of extension from north to south across the caldera, right? And it's worth zooming in so you guys can see that there are clearly times where it, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up. You know, there are things like that that are happening, and these early on seem to correspond to deflation and inflation cycles when we're having big deflation and inflation cycles during this era. Um, which is something we're not seeing right now. And yet, right now we're seeing a similar contractional pattern here. This is the, the curiosity of our week here. What's going on with this? And I don't really have a good answer. We'll just talk about what we're seeing as the clues and wait for the USGS to, to give us more information as well. So that's contraction north to south. And to show you guys that it's localized, First, let's look at the plot from uh, Pool area, north and south of the rift zone, and it's still unaffected, still also contracting, right? If you were to see this thing shooting upwards like this, while this one shoots downwards, then you then that's what you'd say, okay, it's leaving here and going to over here. Right? But we're not seeing that. We're seeing, okay, it's not coming into here, but it's also not coming into here. That's the, the, the key of it, right? So no extra risk on the rift zones um, evident from any of this data. But to dig, dive in a little more, let's look at the two-year GPS plots. Here is our Uwikahuna plot in the northwest. And so I, I should talk, to, talk through this a little more because these plots look similar, similar to the one we just looked at, like this. Looks similar to this, but it's totally a different thing, right? So, okay. This one here is two stations, and we're looking at uh, uh, their absolute locations north to south and measuring the distance between them, right? In this case, we're looking at a single point, and that point has three axes. One axis is to the north, one axis is to the east, and one axis is to the up, up and down, right? So on each of these plots, like one of these like this, this top panel is the east, the middle panel is the north, and the bottom panel is the up. Right? So what I've done here is I've laid out something, a station in northwest Iwakahuna with one in the east. And you can see that as far as north and south, they have exactly the same pattern. As far as up and down, they have exactly the same pattern. But because they are east and west and opposite sides of the caldera, they have flipped east and west signals. If you turn this one upside down, you get this. It's essentially the same data once again. Right, so just to show you how, what this actually is, and similarly, if you look at the southwest and the southeast, similar kind of, you know, now now the um, east-west is looking similar, north-south is looking similar, and up and down is looking similar. Right, so these are both, both being affected the same. And what we're really looking for is the changes within the last few weeks here, 
I gotta zoom way in because these are now two-year plots instead of one-year plots. But here in Uikahuna East, you see a little bit of change. It seems to be wiggling the opposite way, and a little bit of change. And they're really hard to tell, especially with these with these uh, extra long plots, two-year plots. We're looking at even less data points here on the right, so we really can't tell a whole lot. But we're really scrounging for what we can. There's a little bit of a little bit of change visible there. Maybe a little bit visible but there, but not as much. It seems more localized to this area at Wikahuna. We go here to the southwest outlet, and we don't see a whole lot. And note, noteworthy, the up direction isn't changing. Even at Uikahuna, where you see this change in east and, and north, it's actually still rising, which is interesting. So it's not like it's all sagging and, and, and swelling away. It's just wiggling in a way that's, that's interesting. And so I'm calling it deflation and, and contraction, but... Could be more complicated than that. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but that's that's the question that we're examining now for the next few weeks. Here in the southeast, Byron's Ledge, nothing super obvious either, right? Some little minor changes, but nothing that really jumps out at you. And I could go through all these other stations elsewhere in a volcano, but likewise, you don't see a lot of change really anywhere else. It seems at present uh, to be localized to that summit area, right? Especially here on the, on the rift zone, you see just contraction, moving south, moving down. No changes there without without going elsewhere. Um, you can just see that for now, within the limits of how much we can see on this on this suboptimal plot, the most obvious changes are occurring uh, local to the caldera, right? So just some small changes within that area. Certainly things are changing, but it doesn't seem to be a widespread major event across the whole volcano. And we go through that level of detail because we know that people are worried about the Lower East Rift, uh, but just a reminder that those eruptions in the Lower East Rift are, are pretty rare and um, they will happen again someday for sure, but there's no sign of that happening now. And we're just going through it so that uh, you can be sure, assured of the, what the data is actually showing here. And it's not just me talking. So here is the one month summit tilt, the ground tilt on a volcano at the summit of the volcano. There's this blue line here. And you can see deflation, inflation events. We, we've, we've scrolled off the pattern, pattern where they were back to back to back to back to back that occurred more than a month ago. And we switched from that to this pattern of having just a few. And our overall line of tilt was actually rising at that point, right? And we have, we're, we're gaining tilt. And that's when we suspected that the, the effusion rate was going to go back up from that low that we saw last month. And even last week, when we looked at this, we, we saw it fairly flat. But if anything, it seemed to be slightly rising right in there. Yeah. And then from about a week ago, right in here, you can see that we've had Deflation, a little bit of inflation, deflation, a little bit of inflation, deflation, a little bit of inflation. But until this most recent one, our inflation is not recovering to where we were before. So really, the trend has been a downward trend. Very small, very slight, right? If we look at the scale here, we're looking at one to two micro radians. So really, really small signals here. Um, we'll zoom in to the last week. Right there is the last week. So you see coming up, following the previous deflation, and then deflating, coming back up. Does not quite reach the same level, right? Before, does it again. But finally here, the one that's occurring at present right now is getting close to the same level that it dropped from. So we'll see if this trend changes or what's going to happen next. If it's a short-term change, if it's a long-term change, we'll have to wait longer to, to know that. But those are little minor changes happening. Um, visible in a tilt. Lava depth is hard to tell anything from this week. You can see that it's coming up and there's variations. I zoom it way in, you see there's little wiggles going on in here that likely correspond to those uh, deflation inflation variations as well. But because it's been foggy and rainy, we've had some of these bad data points coming and blowing out our scale, so we really can't see the detail in there. And that's true both in our both in our one month and in our one week plots. So I really really can't tell you much about that. Um, that's useful this week. So finally in monitoring data, we'll come to our one month of SO2. And we have uh, another measurement. Right? So we talked about one last week that was up here in this higher values at 22 or 2,000 tons per day. 
we've dropped down the following day to 1300 tons per day right in here. So we're basically showing that same variability, that large range in a short period of time. I come back up to the, the morning of the, of the 7th. Morning of the, the yeah the seventh. Where's my right in here? That was the beginning of that deflation. So maybe there's some variation in the output level going on that that that, that was caught. Um, but the fact that overall you're seeing a lot of these lower values and kind of bouncing around a lot more, you know, could could make you suspicious about about how much lava and gas is actually coming out of there, right? So we've talked about before how we, maybe there's some extra low values, but maybe we're not getting enough samples. And then we saw the high one. We thought, oh, okay, that's that seems unreasonable. But here's another low one again, and we can keep that that book open in case we are seeing more fluctuations as it prepares to do some kind of change. But that's also not clear. It's just what we're looking for to see what might be coming up next. So SO2 is the main hazard still. Producing a VOG uh, for South Hawaii, West Hawaii. So we'll talk about, um, about the uh, gases next uh, as part of our hazard um, update. But just to wrap things up here on a monitoring, um, this is all uh, USGS is saying in their reports is that um, everything is ongoing, no significant changes, and the current stats and really they're, you know these changes are so minor, not, not, not even worth mentioning in here, right? They're talking about they see minor inflation, minor deflation, but everything is essentially uh, within acceptable variation, right? So. Nothing you can really say yet, and which is why we're not not um, very solid in anything here, right? Everything's like, oh, it could be this, could be that, and it's just it's more about helping you guys understand all the process that's happening in the volcano and all the things that that could occur, rather than like it's definitely going to do this or it's definitely going to do that. And that way, we can all be part of trying to understand and um, anticipate what might actually happen. So, mahalo yes for all this information that's allowing us to do that. Okay, so let's turn to the uh, hazards, and we'll look first at the uh, SO2 emission um, from the volcano combined with the uh, meteorological forecast, and that produces the VOG map. And you can see that while we typically almost always get South Hawaii over here, and it wraps around Mauna Loa, and we get West Hawaii as well, we're also getting occasional burst to the north now with this forecast where the winds are changing to bring that VOG um, into that saddle area at the very least and perhaps um, perhaps over right and that's that's what we're seeing when, when um, presently right now right that's where we had today which is why we're getting all those camera cameras swamped out with their views so moving to purple air monitors you can see all these yellows over here on the corner side and one thing that happens over on the corner side is sometimes that VOG gets trapped especially up on the hillside and is still an issue from what I have been hearing so we mention it every week but um, it's 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 true it's still going on people are still having to adapt to that and um, it's been one year so it's been one year of having that that gas and VOG back for all these guys and that's the unfortunate part of it going steady for so long the impact that does exist in a VOG has been persistent, of course, right? So, and long term, of course, 2018 was an issue. Then before that, 2008 to 18 was an issue. Ten years of it, and really, it was before that that, that you really got a different pattern because um, the VOG didn't come out from that spot, but the summit came out of pool slightly further away, which meant it actually went slightly more offshore and got taken away rather than getting caught as much. So that's that's a small variation. So really, it's. Um, not something that everyone in Cornell is, is celebrating, perhaps, this one-year uh, milestone coming up, because it's just been more and more VOG. So we'll make sure we mention that here. So within a national park, uh, we have VOG as, uh, as well. And I was going to mention that we have been using this Hawaii SO2 network page for a while. And uh, today, you'll see that Air Resource Specialists is pleased to announce that the Air Quality Health Advisory site has moved to a new home at the NPS site. So here it is, redirecting us to the air quality page as it currently looks. Um, does not look quite right. Let's reload it. There we go. So there is the summary map. It looks like this now. There is our gray circle indicating 
uh, possible effects of the volcanic fumes and that is based off of uh, wind uh, northeast at six miles an hour which is not very fast here and so that's why they're uh, showing it essentially possibly affecting all these areas however all the areas are in a green if you look on a, on a map view here um, we actually can switch the satellite if you want if you're interested in that I can't really do any zooming but you see those and now you can also click on each of these stations and you can go and click on on the history and it'll take you to some of these history sites here right so or you can come here to the top and where it's the summary and charts you can click on the charts and that's showing you SO2 every, every 15 minutes here mostly on the left with these small little tick marks and then PM 2.5 particulate matter over here on the right hourly measurements so Lots of SO2 at Kahuku, as we often see it in that downwind direction. But we're also seeing Uikahuna got a PM 2.5 spike earlier today as well at noon, unhealthy for sensitive groups. So it does come through occasionally. Of course, the park is very aware of this, and they have signs and um, all kinds of stuff out there to help you if you're visiting. But something to be aware of if you're in a sensitive group ahead of time here. So it has been, um, uh, viewing has been uh, accessible still as the, the bottom line there, um, but it is still a hazard to be aware of there. So uh, of course, uh, we're inching into our lava viewing because that's where you have to be to see it is in a national park. Um, presuming you're not uh, able to stream and live stream from two pineapples or someone like that, right? So. That is, of course, why it's such a great benefit and so appreciated that those guys do that. It's not easy for everyone to go up there all the time. So here is a national park map of the viewing areas. And to recap, Uikahuna in the north might be the shortest uh, overlook to get to, um, but it only sees that eastern part of the lava lake, right, which uh, has that area where it's, where it's oozing up and it's uh, um, coming close to that... that uh, down drop block area um, but you can't see the active lake itself hidden behind a cliff over here to the west the next easiest is kupinai pali also known as waldron ledge over here in the east it's also close um, paved all the way visible uh, accessible from the national park uh, main visitor center parking lot um, but it is a slightly longer walk it is paved the whole way but that's that's a, a nice trail that's Call it the Critterim Trail, but it's really um, something we, we've we been calling the Earthquake Trail, or it's been called an Earthquake Trail before. It's part of that Critterim Drive that used to go all the way around. So so right now, this yellow road is the main road. It goes around the crater. It used to actually uh, go like this over here, and like that is how this road used to go. And then this chunk in here fell in during an earthquake in 83. And the road was rerouted around there. So the old road still exists for the most part. It's not wide enough in the collapsed areas to drive a car through, but that's where the trail goes through. So you can kind of walk on the old road. You can push a wheelchair if you wanted to, or a stroller, or what have you, and um, be able to go and see that. It's an old overlook, an old pullout, right, where you walk into here to, to get a view from Kupinai Pali across from the east to the lava lake. And it's at the far end. Two miles away, here's where the lava actually is, but it's a pretty direct view, and you can see over those overflow areas north and south as well from the angle. Um, you can't really see as much on this eastern part of the part of the crater floor, right? So to see this, you got to be up here. But to see the other parts, you can be either at Kupinai Pali over here in the east, or Kanakakoi down here in the south, southeast, right? And we've discussed before how the view from this area is similar to what we get from the B1 camera, which is pointed over here. And so that's often what we look at as a proxy for what what the view might be. And there's a B1 camera as it presently looks. We showed you guys the whole last six months uh, recently, but now we're going to zoom into just this is right now at present. And this is the last week. So from that viewing area, what you might expect to see. Remember, you can't see anything in this foreground right in here, but all the stuff in the back is what you would likely see. So ooze up flows on the sides. And the main lava lake in the pit right in there. So, and of course, if you zoom it way in, 
this is a webcam capture so it's not going to be as sharp as all the nice cameras that that we have shared with us it gives that gives you an idea of what's going on there and what that view might actually look like so from our friends two pineapples there's a little clip of a live stream on september 11th and showing if you use a, a big lens what you can see right? there's a zoomed into that lava lake area the the entry point is over here from the right and there is that one of those sinks over here and this is likely that southeast sink i would guess and a little inset view of that as well up here at the top so Great viewing still still occurring, and um, despite all these little changes we're seeing with the monitoring signals, it seems to really be unaffecting what's happening on the surface. It's still circulating and moving and spattering, and the viewing still great. And maybe we can consider that it won't last forever, right? It won't last maybe indefinitely if we start seeing variations. It might end sometime, but um, curious to see when that might actually happen, right? Um, so. Um, that's the question. I see a question that Dane shared here, a question from Joseph Mellon. How long do you think this eruption will go on? For another year? And I don't know, Dane. Your guess is probably as good as mine. You going to jump in here and help me out? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we didn't do very good on this one the first time, you know, uh, or over under got blown out of the water. I can't remember what it was, but I think we're like at least six months past that, past that on the over. So, um, I mean, at this point, it wouldn't actually be all that surprising if it did stop before the one year anniversary. It'd be kind of funny, but uh, you know, it does. It doesn't have the the, the going steady uh, look to it right now. Um, but we've been here before. Yeah, and, it seemed like it did last you know. week. Last week it seemed like it was, and so is it maybe just a yeah. one week blip? Or is it a long term trend? I don't know. No idea. I mean. Here's the thing about, like, I was thinking, you know, like, when do you, how long will the eruption go? It's like, well, okay, say that, that, that little tiny sky, skylight, uh, crusts over, right? But we still have the inflation. We still have, um, everything else except no ooze outs and nothing at the surface, right? It's like, okay, is it still going or not? Just because we have this thin, you know, crust over the top, is it, the crust you know, is still rising? Start? Yeah, the crust is still rising, right? But we don't have visible lava at the surface anymore. That little bit just, you know, seals up and, you know, what do we, do we say it's ongoing or paused at that point, you know? And then a little ooze up happens, you know, like a few days later, unpaused, oh, it's paused again like 20 minutes later, you know, because it was a quick ooze up, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. It'd be a weird state in between, you know, like, oh, this is erupting and this isn't erupting at that point. Right. And that comes down to purely to our, our definitions of it, right? Like, cause like it's, it's just doing its thing. It's just nature. That doesn't care what you call it. It's going to, going to keep oozing under the crust, above the crust. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care whether you call it an eruption or not, or an intrusion, where it doesn't care if you call it a lava lake or a magma chain. It doesn't care. It's just doing its thing. And once again, nature is trying to challenge our definitions and categorizations. We'll say, oh, if it's, if it stops erupting for four months, we'll call it a pause. We're not a pause, but a new eruption. And so then, okay, then. How about we stop for four and a half months, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or, <exactly>. you know, <laughs> it, it's good at that. Yeah. I mean, that natural things are just happening and it's, they're going to break our categories at some point and we may just be seeing enough activity for long enough that we'll see another challenge to the convention of our, right. our lexicon here. Yeah. So yeah, good point. Well, yeah, well, I want to jump in and uh, acknowledge our super chats that came through. Appreciate everybody that did drop that. Uh, appreciate everybody that's here viewing this. We rely on viewers like you to help get the message out, um, get a little bit more real content for the volcanoes out there instead of just all the hype that you normally find. Uh, we did have a couple super chats come through. Want to recognize those? Skajit Ed was the first for twenty dollars. Says thanks, Dane Phil. Uh, appreciate your efforts to keep us up to date. Uh, Aloha and Mahalo. Appreciate that, Ed. Thank you. We had Chris, a uh, continued supporter, uh, $50, comes through, says, thank you, Phil and Dane, for always keeping us well-informed and sharing your time and knowledge. Thank Appreciate the support there, Chris. And then we had a uh, Ace $20 super chat from Susan L., who just says, mahalo. Appreciate that one. Thanks, uh, you know, again, we are also supported by the County of Hawaii through the Vi Grant to help uh, bring you this type of content. 
So we really, you know, appreciate the county for stepping up and, you know, making it so we can retain what we think is, you know, the integrity needed to do this type of uh, reporting in times of basically peace where things aren't really happening. So when things really pop off and you have lava in neighborhoods, you you have a little bit more uh, resilience and robustness in terms of the networking and all that kind of stuff. Um, We saw this in 2018 and, you know, we're not going to let those lessons just be forgotten. So, yeah, we appreciate the county for stepping in on that one and really helping us out to provide content for another year. Uh, do have a couple questions here for you that you didn't get to. Um, so, Geo Quantum Hub, Hub says, uh, would you would love to hear you uh, what you think about the depth of the Pu'o magma chamber and that system? Uh, do you have any ideas or what's your thoughts about that? Yeah, uh, I mean, just like everything else, I really don't know. I'm just gonna gonna best guess, right? You know, give you guys the the parameters that that we're aware of that help guide this, right? So we know that the all those Middle East rifts and eruptions are fed from the from the rift zone structure itself, which we believe is down at a half mile uh, down to like a, a mile down or so, right? So um that's like you know that's that's the range of it um where it's it, where the source of it actually is right so if you have like a big area like in a, if the rift zone itself is like let's say widened or enlarged or what have you and like that's the chamber area that's the reservoir area the bulk of it um then you'd expect it to be down at that depth right mile down half mile down or something like that mm. And slightly uprift at Makapui, we've heard indications that the rift zone over there is enlarged. It is, it is almost magma reservoir-ish in a sense when, when you saw deflation following 2018 that that area was, had extra, right? Like it was holding more magma in other parts of the rift zone. So that could, that's a good candidate, right? That's probably the best candidate that I, that I would go with. Um, however, between that depth and, and the surface, there was a pathway that was active for a long time and it certainly could have made other little pockets of reservoirs in there as well the question then is did those survive the collapse in 2018 or the 2018 collapse that we saw drop that crater floor down a thousand feet right um what's that quarter mile yeah like halfway back down like you know if if you see collapse that far is there any space left between there and that rift zone area to actually have any more intact reservoir so to re, you know, I I don't know, but as we discuss this, like you know, that that's the kind of the range of what you'd imagine. Like, okay, down there in a deeper part of the rift zone, you might have something larger like that, right? Um, and then you might have some shallower stuff that's trans more transient. That kind of when it collapses is probably not active anymore, right? But I would expect to have a larger area down on a rift zone, half mile mile down ish. That's my my best guess answer. All right. Well, I'm not really seeing any other things here. There was the volcano watch that came out while we were live. Um, they were talking yeah. about. Uh, do you want? Are you gonna talk about I, that? You think? Yeah, I still have a bunch more things to go through. All right. So we'll yeah. save uh, any more questions if you got them. Go ahead and throw them in the chat, and we'll try and get to them. But I think that gets us caught up for now. Yeah, um, we, we're, we're going to talk earthquakes. We're going to talk Mauna Loa. We're going to talk Samoa. I mean, we can talk volcano watch. Um, I suppose we might as well get into it. Um, we could get into it now. Why not? Um, yeah. Today's Volcano Watch is Ahu Ayla Ao. It's a geophysical x-ray using ground-penetrating radar. Now, Ahu Ayla Ao, for those of you guys who haven't kept up, is the new name for Fisher 8 from 2018 eruption. And um, cool to hear that GPR was taken over there and that they did a scan. So I haven't had a chance to go through much of the details here, but we'll do that together. So this is written by uh, NSF research fellow Liz Gallant, mahalo. And they are coming from University of South Florida, right, to bring the, the ground penetrating radar, GPR, um, this past summer. So that uses small radar pulses to detect objects and changes beneath the ground. And when you encounter boundaries between faults, um, like one block of rock, another block of rock, there's a little gap right in there. Um, or a layer of lava, then you have like a, a, ref, a reflection pattern, right? So um, they're using low frequency radio waves and 
that allows you to essentially create an image based on the, all the different um, feedback you get from the, the, all the reflections. So uh, they're attached to a sled and guided along the ground surface and data are collected in lines. So they use different line directions and orientations to tie lines together to get like a 3D mesh essentially. And they can see into the ground depending on two things. The first is the energy that they transmit with GPR so they can use a longer wavelength to see deeper or a shorter one to see shallower. And the second is the type of ground that they're on, right? So when they're on areas that are wet clay or wet soils, then they can't see as well. But dry and hard layers are better. And that is what lava and tephra falls into, right? So it's actually pretty good uh, um, set up there, allowing them to image 50 feet, 50 meters into the cone using 100 megahertz antennas, right? So it says it's plotted on a radar gram. Um, their main purpose is to understand how the cinder cones grow, right? Because really, really um, 50 feet down, um, how, how far above the original ground level is that, Dane? I mean, in that area, right? It's... Yeah, I mean, it seems higher than that to me. Um, it seems like you're sitting on like a 60-foot base or something like that of lava, and then it yeah. goes up. Yeah, so, you're, so you're, you're not actually looking at anything that's underground, right? Just, just following up on our pool kind of reservoir discussion we're not looking right. at anything that could be a reservoir it's like all the surface that stuff is piled up on top of what the ground where the ground used to be, used to be before 2018 right so so yeah that's why it's really looking at how the cinder cones are, are growing right so and they come to to say the name cinder cone is a bit of a misnomer because features like Ahuela Ao are not built entirely out of uniform piles of cinder in fact it's mostly basaltic pumice right that's likely uh, uh that um, reticulite um, <laughs> material that we're sharing quite a lot right. of, right? And we've we've um, talked about before, and similar to what that what you might get in that core of the crusts of the summit lava lake now that is essentially so light, right? Right. Um, so that's yeah, the they talk about people that, don't know that you can crush in your hand. It's very um, brittle. Yeah. 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 The difference is because our lava is so fluid, all of, all the little bubbles that are in the the froth all get connected, and so you get something that looks more like a Brillo pad than what you imagine as like that white chunk of pumice you get from like the Pacific Northwest, for example, right? That t traditional pumice that when you put it in water, it actually will float because all those little bubbles of gas are all trapped in the rock. In our Hawaiian version, they're all connected, so it's like a big sponge, and the water just flows right through and it actually sinks. So it's a little different, and that's why we don't usually call it pumice, just because people associate that with the other kind of magma of volcanoes, and so that's why, you know, but just because they were saying basaltic pumice here, I just thought I'd talk through that a little bit here. Right, so yeah, um, so yeah, uh, wind direction, fountain height, all those things, uh, overflows likely as well, right, that we talked about, all, all uh, help them image the inside of the cone for all of that. So let's see here what they say. Um, the pictured radiogram shows little things that are a little more complicated, not nearly as delicious as a simple sloped cake model. The upper part is made mostly of tephra. These layers are invariably thick and not continuous. There's a little bit of spatter, globs of lava that stick together when they land. Um, and they describe it as essentially a very lumpy cake that lacks well-defined layers and contains only a small amount of icing. The sections of the cone that, are bound, that bound the opening into the spillway contain a greater amount of spatter than the section shown in the radar gram. So like, you know, by the mouth itself, right, is where you have all the overflow and actually more of that lava interlayering in there. So they combine the results with monitoring data and other geophysical surveys to help understand um, the whole 3D um, feature here, right? So they will share the results of the survey after they complete data processing. And here is a little preview. And focusing on the East Rift Zone, there's Ahu Ailaau at the head of the flow area. And you can see here, these seem to be the lines that they've uh, transected, right? So, and considering that they say they put this on a sled and dragged it along, maybe you can go out and look, Dane, look for some sled tracks, see if there's anything, anything still yeah. out there from, from back during the <laughs> summer sometime, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised and, I didn't get any. Reports uh, from you know residents that were like, "Hey, who's these guys trying to sled down uh, Fisher Eight? 
you yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, or hopefully your people are right. informed, right? <laughs> So the yellow one here, that's the one that's that's uh, being highlighted here. And this looks, this is what the GPR result look like. And um, when you see these these bright uh, layers, that's the, the the reflector layers, right? And so that's what you're what they're highlighted highlighted in these dark lines here, to give you an indication of what the structure might actually look like. And this is not not too dissimilar to what you might see as an oil survey, for example, right? You have just look, looking for structure of the earth and where oil might be trapped underground, that kind of thing. Similar kind of look to the data here. But in this case, looking at the shallow, shallower stuff, right, with a, a lower frequency. And, uh, or maybe it's, yeah. Um, I'm showing that, showing that image there. Yeah, so pretty cool. So that is what we're going to watch this week. Anything else, Dane? No, um, if you if anybody has questions, we will be going um, into. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We yeah, will be going in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. My bad. Questions on the volcano watch. I'm talking about. Yo, I don't have any. No. Um, um, yeah. Uh, I don't, don't see any in chat either. So I think we All can right. continue on. So uh, next is our earthquakes. So let me get earthquakes on here. And we will look at what's happening with that. That's not my earthquakes. Let's get the earthquake plot on here. There it is, Kilauea first. So one year earthquakes on Kilauea. Uh, here we are at the right end, and we're in a normal. No surprises there. Here is zoomed into the last month, and little variations, but overall pretty normal too. And in the last week. Zoom it in so you can see better. There is our south flank pattern. We're having around the summit area, they seem to be not so much right under the lake, but uh, either to the east over here or in this spot by the campground to the northwest, which is an area we've seen before um, seem to adjust. It's a, a, a kind of a catch point between Mauna Loa and Kilauea that seems to um, respond to movement between the volcanoes, um, including when the magma chamber of Kilauea is moving. Um, swelling or or emptying. In the past, we've seen them more when it's swelling. Um, and down here in Pahala, you see that same pattern of earthquakes. It's still having the closer to Kilauea, closer to Loihi, and there's another part of it off the map here, closer to Mauna Loa too. So on earthquakes, everything is normal. On Kilauea, there's the, the time depth depth and time and just showing how the, how there's variations over time so again Pahala is going pretty steady right? not continuously but you know pretty often regular enough for a natural earth process and appear in a upper elevations as well at like the shallower depths perhaps of the south flank area so looking at our earthquakes map there is that second Pahala cluster visible on the, on the Mauna Loa side right there. And otherwise, there's Kilauea. You see we have a couple of these settling events at 3.3. That's deep, 39 kilometers. That's just west of Hilo. Uh, one under Mauna Kea, 2.1, 17 kilometers deep. And one over here close to Waikoloa, 19 kilometers deep, 2.8. So several of these settling earthquakes, deep ones under this north part of the island. Otherwise, Mauna Loa, we can see there still are some events, but um, not a whole lot of them are showing up on this map here. We're getting, um, one thing to note is that this map has a threshold, right? It might be something like 1.5 or something like that. So here we have a 1.7, there's a 1.8, it may actually be 1.7, I'm not sure I see anything less than a 1.7 on here. No, there's a 1.6, well there's a 0 0.8, but they don't, maybe don't always get caught and put on here. So. For this reason, I like to go to the um, Mauna Loa summit map of seismicity because that's showing us a little bit, a little bit more information here. So you see a more diffuse pattern. Earthquakes are still happening, but you can see they're not really focused in any one place. And if anything, anything, they're kind of 
um, widespread um, in the southeast part especially, but even this northwest quadrant they seem a little bit more spread out than usual used to seeing. Still not in huge numbers, that's really the important thing here. Um, you can look at earthquake values for the last month here and they're pretty normal right in there, yeah. Um, so um, let me transition our heading to Mauna Loa here since that's our current topic and we'll, we'll come back to some of the other earthquakes here in a bit but we'll do it in the context of Mauna Loa. So for the last year in Mauna Loa here we are at the right end. Earthquakes per week have been over 100 still so we have uh, four weeks in a row and really uh, five out of the last uh, six here that have been these high rates and really seven out of the last nine at these higher than 100 earthquakes per week rate right in here, right? And that in itself is not alarming. You can see a period of time back here, um, not quite a year ago, where we were getting eh, not quite as much as that. But there are times when it was elevated as well. So this is all within a slightly elevated above background, as the USGS terms it. If we look at the whole month map, it's a little clearer where these earthquakes are occurring. You see that pattern. Uh, under the summit in the northwest here, more of in a cluster, more clustered than we're seeing in just in the last week, so which is why, why I say that the last week is a little bit more scattered. And then zooming out to the last five years of rates, you can see that earthquakes per month were above 400 earthquakes in the last couple months here, which is higher than we've had in the previous uh, several months, right? Uh, back to early 2021, right? And you can see that there are, within the last five years, quite a bit of time when we've had these elevated rates going back to post 2018 all through here and this entire time is non-eruptive so all this signals signals visible on here have have led were adjustments in the volcano but nothing actually caused an eruption so when we see something happening not quite as big we say yeah it's still adjusting um, but it's not anything to be alarmed about yet because it can do clearly larger adjustments than that without even erupting Right, so keep an eye on it in case it does climb up higher because it can do that. But there's no indication of that yet. It's still just making us wait as usual, um, as we expected, because we've been waiting on her for a long time. Um, not that we're eager for her to erupt, um, but she she does a lot of movement without actually um, going towards eruption within our lives here, especially in the last how in the last fifty years almost, right? Um, all right, so moving to our uh, GPS on Mauna Loa. Here is across Caldera distance, north to south, uh, across Mauna Loa summit for the last year. And this is something we've been scrutiniz scrutinizing for several weeks now and talking about the spread of data, the range of data, these variations up and down, and you know how you can actually try to estimate what's going on here. And last week, we we're talking about how maybe we're, we could look at the average, maybe heading up. But looking at this week, all the data is pretty well clustered, and it seems to be more in a down direction over here, which that's that's fascinating. Um, so we see this, once again, like you know, that this amount of data by itself is not enough to to really make any conclusions. We've seen times where it seemed to do, have little dips like that before. The variation is is quite large everywhere, right? So you have to wait to see what it does next, but. It's giving an indication of doing something a little different than last week, right? And one curiosity that's something that might come to mind, and I will ask it before anyone else does, because someone may be thinking it as well, is well that's curious. This seems to be about the same time as Kilauea is having the same contraction at its summit, kind of in a similar time scale here. Is like could something be actually affecting both of them? And that's a really hard thing to answer, right? It kind of that that kind of um, coincidence because if it was something that was affecting both of them from the middle, for example, it should be pushing them different directions, not having them do the same thing. So more likely you have something happening at each summit at the same time, but independently. So if it's not independent, what could connect them? If anything, maybe the source back down to the hotspot eventually, right? But we think that's something that takes months for that pressure to kind of propagate across. Um, but just for the sake of looking at it a little more closely, um, let's look at, this is that same 
time versus depth plot for Kilauea, and this is the Pahala zone once again. And if we look at the last month, you can see that really those deep earthquakes, Pahala, which is not necessarily directly correlated to like the pressure coming from that that deep pipeline, but you'd imagine it's it's related in some way. There's no obvious change visible on on that pattern, right? So you can consider it, but you really don't really get anywhere thinking that and. Uh, the simplest explanation is really that they're they're uh, both going through uh, a cycle that just ha happens to be at the same time. And as we said, Mauna Loa is maybe something that's just a little wiggle within that data as well. So, um, however, uh, we really don't know enough about, about Pahala. And I'll just follow up with a couple of these photographs that were released this week as well um, from September 6th of this project in the Southwest Rift Zone, seismic nodes being collected. Right? So here are some images of HVO staff and UH Manoa, University of Hawaii Manoa collaborators, uh, walking on lava flows from 1823 along the National Park boundary uh, to collect the seismic nodes. Right? In this particular image, they're actually walking um, along the Great Crack. That's what this big crack, this big uh, trench is right over here and that great crack is like a surface association of the southwest rift zone so that whole southwest rift is moving ocean oceanwards um the ocean side is moving oceanwards at south flank as well and then that can um help uh, the great crack exist here and it's from the great crack where we had uh, a big effusion of lava in 1823 a big it was not too unlike what we saw in um 2018 actually where you had some summit collapse and lava drained from the summit and spilled out of the rift zone and went all the way to the ocean. But this was a southwest rift zone version and not a southeast rift zone version like we saw in 2018. So 1823, it went the opposite way, right? So that'll be something we'll probably talk about more next year. And that'll be the 200 year uh, anniversary of that eruption, which is actually the, the, the first Western account of eruption on Kilauea. So next year we'll mark 200 years of Western observation, which is not to um, undervalue the Hawaiian observation that occurred previously because there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot there, and we'll go into that more, of course, but we can celebrate all of those things, I think. So, seismic nodes on Southwest Rift, that's what one looks like. Here they are measuring with a compass to uh, note the direction and all, all those things, right? You need to kind of have, have your orientation so that when you go and collect the data back in the lab, you can then say, okay, well, these, these earthquake waves maybe came from that direction or this direction or et cetera, et cetera. So they are going to use over 80 nodes to image down to 25 or 31 miles down, 40, 50 kilometers down, all the way down. So that should catch that entire magmatic system coming up in that area. They're taking notes on the uh, locations and orientations and all of that, right? All this crucial data you need to take back so that when you're processing back in the lab, you can do all your calculations correctly. And we've talked about these Volcano Watch articles before, so I'll just kind of keep moving on that. But while they're also out there, they're also documenting um, nice features. Here is Lava Tree. Um, and maybe I'll switch my, my uh, caption here. So now we're not talking about Mauna Loa as much anymore. Now we're coming back to some of this media. And here is a Lava Tree. And in this case, Lava Flow came from this direction, touched this large enough tree that was likely cool and moist and hardened against that tree trunk and the lava kept flowing the tree being exposed to the atmosphere burned away and just left a cast and since this cast is still standing upright this is termed a lava tree you can see the flow directions lava, lava, lava wrapping around you know, both ways and then um, up higher as well, right? And one cool thing that I, I always uh, like to point out is when lava was flowing through an area like this, it was, it was essentially a flash flood of lava is how I think about it. For lava to actually have reached this this point on the tree, the depth of lava in this area had to have been that deep everywhere, right? So lava f uh, surged across this area, wrapped around this tree, and as it flows downhill and away, then this upper crust that was connected up here, it sags back down and around where you have a column, you have a series of cracks, and then the ground collapses around it, but then this thing ends up sticking through to the original depth. So this is the original depth of lava, the lava tree here.
A little, little too much in lava trees, but there you go. Looking into it, straight down, there's a cast of that former trunk. Sometimes you can see some um, interesting uh, minerals or um, uh, reaction reactions here. Uh, more that you have the interaction of that organic material with that hot lava, but hard to tell from this picture. Sometimes you see the actual impressions of the burned charcoal of the tree as the lava is still fluid and pushes and squeezing into those little gaps, um, but not the resolution. We can see it right here, right? All you can really see is like, the cracked area around this whole feature where everything collapsed around it here. Just jump in real quick. Um, one little thing that I saw. Uh, so 2018, the lava trees were uniquely huge just because of the Albizia trees were covered in it. One thing I did not uh, expect to see when I climbed down into one of those tree molds just to see what was at the bottom because, you know, with the Ohia tree molds, you can never do that. Climbed down in the thing and uh, sawdust at the bottom. A ton of sawdust, basically. Mm. Like all those fine wood particles down there and just uh, about an inch deep. I was wow. highly surprised to find that down at the bottom, but it was down there. Yeah, I mean, um, albizia has got an interesting character of wood too. I wonder. Yeah, that's interesting to consider different yeah. kinds of woods, how they how they react. Well, he has a very hard wood, so maybe that's why you don't get that powder stuff. Right, and it wasn't like uh, burnt or anything like that either. It was just you know, uh, powdered wood basically sitting down there, just a, a nice layer. Yeah, sometimes you actually can see the, the the wood itself of the tree that got burned. Sometimes the, the, sometimes right. the lava come around, come come so fast it just burns the bottom of the tree. It's crusted over. The tree falls on the crust, which is hot, so it can actually char the char the tree, but it won't it won't actually burn the whole thing. Sometimes that crust can even yeah. carry it away and like throw it in the ocean, it's still charred and yep. still actually a tree. Yeah, um, we saw when that. I cl climbed in Ohia trees. The coolest thing, uh, tree tree casts, tree molds, right? Um. The, the the most you usually see is where the where the roots of the tree flare out at the bottom, right? So often you have to see like a shaft coming down and at the bottom it flares outwards, and you know that you've actually found that root system. And you kind of like, then you can you're yep. looking for a cool geology. That's where you like poking around in that little gap under there. But it's not not most people's idea of fun to crawl in a hole and start, right. <laughs> you know like right. troweling the sides that, a bit. <laughs> that, that, those albizium molds at the bottom is like a giant. It's like a chamber. Basically, it's it's pretty big in there. I mean, you could easily get multiple people down there and be comfortable. Like they're they're pretty big, some of them. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah. was it still warm when you went in there? Was it soon enough? Uh, no, no, no. I mean, we went in in uh, two thousand. Just I think it was still two thousand eighteen when we did that. And no, not not warm like that. You know. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I've 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 been in Kalapana and seen some of those that actually have have been glowing for months and months and months afterwards, but the flow is still active in the area, of course, right? Right. I uh, I one time I almost, almost broke my leg in one, which was a it was a big mango tree, um, tree mold, right? So I I I saw like a giant I, like a giant center trunk and all the branches and lots of holes everywhere. And I, I saw, saw them, I'm like oh they're all over here, let's they're all over here, like let's walk all the way around but then notice that there was had been one branch that was one of those must have been a long low branch that kind of came, came way out and there was a, another by itself hole of that trunk ahead of me that i almost stepped into and i was glad not to have because that would have been, been a, yep. a leg snapper yeah the yeah. albizias are dangerous in that they they fall over too early uh, so mm -hmm. we found i found one that was a horizontal lava tree mold of a giant albizia and that thing was terrifying because you didn't know if you were standing on one of the branches that went out and if it was going to cave in under you type of thing. It was just <laughs> highly uh, suspect in there. Like had to just get away from it, you know, come go back out the same way we came in because that thing was just like you're afraid to take a single step. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lava Tree State Park down there. Yeah. Has has some of those also. If you look closely or not, they didn't. There weren't albizias back then, right? And that was like the 1790 right. era, right? Um, but there were big trees like what he is and the things, and you can definitely look down and see through big, big columnar shafts, right? Where the where the where the, the lava tree has fallen over. And technically speaking, if they're upright, your lava trees after falling over, they're tree molds. But I mean, that's just the if you're, if you're taking a geology quiz, that's, that's the only time you really need to know that. Otherwise, people really know what you're talking about if you see either one. In my experience, right. Here. 
All right. Well, sorry for the divergence on tree molds. Well, we might as well get into tree molds a little bit. Yeah, but since yeah. we are running a little long. Let me see if I can wrap up where we were here. I was on Mauna Loa earthquakes. I think I was almost done with Mauna Loa, but let me actually finish it properly. Um, by showing the USGS weekly update here that is confirming not erupting, slightly elevated above background level, seismicity, and other streams showing no significant changes. The number for the last week for earthquakes, 158, below magnitude 3, all in that same pattern, no uh, noteworthy GPS changes, right? See, this has been consistent for the last many, many months, all these little, little wiggles we're talking about, and discussing like that none of that's even worth their time to put any update just just so we're you know everyone's clear on that right we're kind of just um picking at it with a fine tooth comb here but really it's overall little wiggles that are normal and same with so2 and, and the other no. indicators here one last thing on mauna loa um this is a little clip that was posted to hawaii tracker Things are popping up everywhere here, but this was posted at Hawaii Tracker um, by Ciro Defrayer, right? And this is a, a Facebook reel um, of a hike. Let's see if I can get this to play here. Yeah, and we'll play it quiet for the guys. Um, let's see if I can get it, get it a little closer for you guys. So this is a little reel of their hike up from the National Park side. Up the Mauna Loa Trail, Red Hill Cabin, up to Mauna Loa Summit, looking out across the Sea of Clouds. This is a very, very tough hike, right? It's an amazingly beautiful hike, but you're up at altitude. And so you get to see you get to see all these amazing volcanic features. This looks like the North Pit. Um, cabin. So there are cabins to help you shelter, but yeah, it is freezing. You need to, you need to be prepared. And there is a summit caldera itself. Mahalo to those guys for posting this and sharing it with the Hawaii Tracker Group. You got some good footage in there. Really good footage, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, this reminds me, of course, that uh, uh, our buddies, Two Pineapples, did this very same hike and um, have something similar upcoming at some point too. So we'll come back and revisit this in slightly longer format than this this reel that we're showing you guys here. But just to kind of shim the waters a little bit, good thing to share with you guys. Amazing landscapes and views and colors and and yeah, the lack of oxygen maybe helps helps make everything look more amazing. Perhaps I don't know. Pretty pretty epic up there. So okay. remote. That's Mauna Loa. Um, we have a little more, which is Samoa. Let me put on Samoa on here, and we can wrap this up. There has not been a whole lot of, of new information on Samoa, but we'll cover what's going on. There's our orientation map, and still Ta'u Island is the center of monitoring and activity here. Some of the instruments are elsewhere on other Ofu Olosega Island as well. Let's load our Raspberry Shake data view here. And it's showing differently than it was before, but there is a, you can see there's one big earthquake right there, that long, that signal like that, that's the earthquake. And some little ones, but what you're not seeing is lots and lots and lots of big ones like we were seeing early on. So they're still occurring. Just from this plot, you can see that, but they're occurring at lower rates, right? And that's what we'll see is what the USGS is saying. So, oh, my forum got reset. So let me load it here. Let's choose HVO. Let's choose Ta'u Island. Let's look at these in reverse order here, right? So most recently today, this forum continues over the past hour. seismicity was low. There was an earthquake at 7.36 AM. This is American Samoa time. Magnitude similar to larger earthquakes in the swarm, earlier in the swarm, people on Ofu Island felt it. And seismologists analyzed this event and determined it occurred in the same location as earlier felt earthquakes. So no migration, everything is still in the same place. A fourth bright band seismometer was installed in American Samoa in Tutuila Island yesterday. As a result, 
Data will be available on a Taiwo Island interactive website map tomorrow. I've been looking. I checked it today earlier. I was like, oh, it's almost there, almost there. And now they're saying it's going to be tomorrow. So next week, we'll be able to bring that to you guys. Um, this kind of, that's the most current thing. We can kind of step back through the week. Uh, yesterday's update, um, low seismicity. There was a magnitude 5.9 that occurred 190 miles southeast. Um, but uh, it was not part of that ongoing, ongoing swarm. They are noting data backfilling September 12th for an outage at OFU Breadman Seismometer. And go back to the previous day. They say it was temporarily down and they're repairing and backfilling the data. Otherwise, several noticeable earthquakes, none reported, low levels of, of seismicity. And if I go back further, the next, the previous day is just low seismicity, nothing else to even say that day. The previous day, no felt earthquakes. Frequency is leveled out, but remains low. And that's kind of where we are now, leveled out, but low, following a pattern of, of decreasing seismicity, um, really the end of August and beginning of September here. Lower number of earthquakes does not mean that earthquakes were more end. There was also a magnitude 7.6 earthquake in Papua New Guinea detected across a seism seismic network. And then they were repairing the FAGA seismometer. And so there's there's kind of they're updating all the equipment, and so we'll see the earthquakes on the map uh, tomorrow, and update them for you guys next week, and similar stuff last week Saturday and Friday here, right? Um, so here is the earthquakes map for the area. Here is American Samoa. No earthquakes plotting on there yet, right? But if I zoom it out, you can see where we are here. Tonga's down here. Uh, Fiji over there, so you can see this line is a the Tonga Trench. This is that tectonic plate boundary. So that's what generates most of the earthquakes in the area is this whole plate boundary. So if you can get one here. That's that 5.8 they discussed that was detected yesterday. But I can also zoom it out some more, right, and you can see that there all the way to Papua New Guinea. There 7.0 and elsewhere these earthquakes could very easily transmit to Samoa so likely when we have this this uh, new data source um, we'll be getting improved location on some of these other other events but we're really going to be getting getting resolution just for right in here is what we're really looking for so that's the context of it we'll wrap it up with a few pictures there's a few final pictures of Samoa here is USGS installing GPS stations in Samoa on September 7th um, there's one on a tripod. You can see it's way down with sandbags and the legs, so it can stay in place. Solar panel, uh, battery, and uh, data logger and electronics box right in here. So um, we know what GPS is for, right? So that's the GPS station, one of them. There is another one of them installed. Interesting to see the vegetation and the topography here at the edge of the island. Um, it's placed on a tripod that's leveled and centered over a benchmark. So there are benchmarks in those locations that's marked on the ground as well. So they can actually um, come and if something happens, they can replace it and recalibrate it if needed. And the GPS units would complement the seismometers recently installed. And one more installation photograph here within view of the beach. Um, panel, electronics box, there's a, once again, the tripod with a receiver, GPS receiver, and interesting that they have it so close to the ocean, right? I'm sure that they're considering all their, their variables, but um, I would be a little worried to be this close to the ocean myself, right? If you know that there's so many earthquakes around, we know, there, know that there are tsunami in the area, um, and just the movement of the ground from the shaking of the waves and that kind of thing will be will, might give you a little extra noise, but you do what you can, right? You got everything's got to be connected and spread out wherever. And you know, I know know nothing about the locations and the, the um, compromises that have to, have to be made on there. So I'm sure that they're doing the best they can. And they know way more than I do about where to put these things. But I thought I was curious, and that's, they're definitely pretty to see it near, next to the ocean, but. I wouldn't put one of these down in 
Beach Park and Hilo. That's maybe what I was thinking. All right. So a couple of last pictures, and these are of sample collections. So August 30th, a little bit further back, and a geologist is here on Taiwo Island using a rock hammer to break open a lava sample. And this is because the staff who are there are not only monitoring instrumentation, but they're also collecting samples to understand and reconstruct the activity of the volcanoes in Samoa. So there is one, and this last picture is actually a little bit more uh, illustrative of what, where, and why they're doing this. And here it is, loaded finally, August 30th. So here is the geologist on an outcrop. I can kind of scroll it down. It's not as easy to tell, but this right here looks like the road down in there, right? So the road comes around, and it's like a road cut, and there's a curb down here. And what you see is some rubble rock right in there. It looks like it could be like the bottom of an a'a flow, for example. And a big massive rock could be the core of an a'a flow. You see this, it's got a particular character of, of uh, vesicles, which are these bubbles of gas trapped in a rock. I guess not uh, honeycombed all the way through. It's kind of smaller pockets and other, overall a fairly dense core here. And more rubble, and looks like maybe some some more massive rocks on top, right? So hard to tell really the detail with all the vegetation and just one photograph here, but their caption will tell us that at this location, the samples of a sequence of alternating pahoehoe and a'a lava flows were sampled to help reconstruct the, the eruptive activity of Tatu volcano. So that's just a little bonus of. While they're there, they might as well collect these samples and send them to the lab and start trying to understand um, the history of the area so they can better understand what might happen next. So that's Samoa, and um, that is most of it. There's only a couple final things to discuss, and um, that is community-based here. One is the Pohuiki article that update that, that Dane uh, uh, wrote up on hawaiitracker.com if you want to go and read it in more detail. I'll probably just talk briefly about it here. But also just to mention, um, just scheduling wise, in September there are still After Dark in a Park occurring in the National Park every Tuesday. There are uh, Walk in the Pass with Dr. Thomas A. Jagger, uh, portrayed by Dick Hirschberger, that there's one uh, occurring tomorrow, 10 a.m. at noon, and then on the 30th as, as well, for about an hour. That's a really fascinating program that we'll bring you guys more information on in the future here. Um, they have uh, stewardship at the summit. Um, the Dark Skies presentation was this past week, so we'll skip that one, but there's artist in residence talk this next week, September 20th, um, about uh, inspiration of the volcanic landscapes and the great outdoors for her uh, oil paintings. September 24th, Saturday, is a fee-free day in all public lands nationwide. So also in our national park, and they're having a, a cleanup day for the first 30 people to, that want to participate to arrive. And then that following week is Tuesday the 27th, 7 p.m., is the talk of the eruption anniversary week. That'll be our, our essentially our update from the USGS. Um, usually those are the better part of an hour. And then that same week, a couple days later, on Thursday on the 29th, will be the Uwekahuna um, presentation by the National Park and USGS that we're still trying to, trying to set up to share with you guys, and more on that in the future. So that's the um, scheduling update, and really the last thing to talk about, Dane, is Puhuiki, whatever you want to tell us about that. Okay, can't hear you. All right, well, I'm going to set it up a little bit, um, try and go through this, uh, give a little context on the whole thing so you guys can kind of understand what's going on there. So start at the beginning. Poiki was an old fishing village that, or old fishing community, one of many, right? All the Apuas had their own way to get into the water back then when they were uh, fishing out of canoes. Then eventually a transition happened from canoes to prop motors uh, after World War II. And everybody basically started launching out of Poiki because it was the only area within basically 100 miles that you could get into the water with a prop motorboat um, because of the, the depth and it was also uh, sheltered, right? So it's the only boat ramp in the area. 
and it was also a high grossing boat ramp. Like the, it was very difficult to fish out of Boiki. Like launching and bringing your boat into that ramp was very sketchy. But if you know how to do it, you know how to fish the grounds. I mean, people made the, their livelihoods that way, right? So 2018 comes along. The eruption uh, misses the boat ramp itself, takes the northeastern end of the Poiki Beach area, and then wraps around and begins to inundate the bay with tons and tons of sand. The sand filled in first first bay, then second bay, and then down into third bay now. And since about 2019, the sand has more or less been pretty much at an equilibrium. It hasn't really changed all that much. There's oscillations and things along those lines, but it's mostly consistent. So we began talk after the eruption to remove that sand, right? To get rid of uh, the sand to create a a channel for boats to get back out into the water again. That has been a very slow process with many holdups. Um, recently, a community meeting was had in order to discuss options for the boat ramp after years of uh, discussion and basically pulling teeth to get there. And in that uh, presentation, three options were presented. Two options for digging a unsupported channel into that beach that you see there so digging out enough for a boat to get through and then the second option was a little wider than that third option was an option that was presented originally back in 2019 that involved uh, setting up jetties right these jetties were going to be expensive but they were going to basically what the sea engineers were saying guarantee that it's a long-term solution this these three options were rejected by the community and instead the community uh, went in favor of dredging out the entire bay to get rid of all the sand. The idea being that most of the inundation happened back in 2019, and now that we don't see those those same rates, if we got rid of all this material now, it wouldn't come back, or if it did come back, it would be at a rate which would be acceptable. We dredge all harbors at some point or another, so it would go into that bucket again. Um, so the community spoke and said rejected the three options. A fourth option was put out on the table and was already being discussed by the engineers themselves to get rid of all the sand. And all the sand means between the point on dead trees, that surf spot that got covered partially covered in 2018, on the top there, that red line, running all the way through First Bay, through the First Bay Reef and all getting all that sand out, and then down through Second Bay. Now, that's a lot of material to move out of there, right? The interesting thing about it is that some of that material, they're planning on storing around the area, right? We, we only saw the plans to store the sand on the new lava flows, the flows from 2018. And storing that sand, back, the plans we saw was only for that initial channel, right? So they have a lot more material they're going to have to deal with. But these are the, the things that the engineers are going to have to come up with and figure out. The estimate on this thing is going to be somewhere probably in the high end of 30 to $40 million. So it's not cheap, but it comes in under the jetty idea. So, I mean, it's, it could be roughly half that cost and still be a permanent solution. So right now, where we stand is that the Limit Co. and Sea Engineering are working on revising the pre-draft report, which put on the table the three options to now include the fourth option, which is going to be the option which is pursued. So I hope that gets everybody caught up on the Poiki situation. The interesting thing to me, is the thing that immediately jumps out to me, is if you get rid of all of the sand between First Bay and the end of Second Bay, we're going to get our surf spots back, right? We're going to get, uh, maybe they're not going to look the same. They're going to be different. But, hey, you know, Second Bay, uh, Chambers, First Bay Reef, First Bay, I mean, there might be something there. Um, there's not much there now, right? The sand really screwed it up. But you get rid of that sand, hey, I mean, what's stopping it from returning? So, yeah, that's the Poiki update. So, into September is the plan for the draft proposal to be released publicly. I still haven't seen it. I've just been talking with the guys that are kind of writing it and working off of that. So, this is a what you see here is an unofficial me and Microsoft Paint in about 30 seconds kind of 
just showing you what the the lines that we're thinking of in terms of where the material is going to come out. Those aren't exact by any you know stretch of the imagination, but it gives you the rough picture of what the concept is. So yeah, that's Bowiki. Yeah, and so uh, timelines beyond that, it would have to be approved by the state and funded. And right. Maybe next summer, it could actually start. Hopefully. Yes. If things go well. That would yeah. be about where it is, if everything goes well. The project might also have to be scaled back some, which wouldn't be a huge issue. I mean, most of the sand that we're talking about here is um, in Second Bay, the vast majority of it. The, the stuff that's blocking the boat ramp itself is a maybe a quarter to a third of the total volume um so if you had to scale back and you leave leave you know more of a beach down second bay at the end okay you know but that's kind of where we're work, what we're working with so hopefully next summer we can start seeing some of that sand getting removed yeah obviously you want to you get out as much as possible because whatever you leave can then get pushed around right and that you know if, right. even if you leave it as a beach it might not want to stay there it might get might want to go back towards a boat ramp and then you know if that's the case you just gotta maintain it at some point in the future and that's really the big open open-ended question mark is how much maintenance will it actually take that we don't right. really know we can't know until we actually move some sand to really know that so that's right. that's really you know um a good good path forward to Scoop, scoop as much as you can and kind of go from there right and if you really need need something longer term than that you can cross that bridge when you get there and you'd know a lot more and you'd have a better idea that your money would be well spent and etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean one thing that we that was, that was discussed that we haven't actually has that actually come in a plan yet and we'll have to wait to see if it is in the plan is is whether that sand is actually just discarded nearby or whether it's used repurposed. i don't think they have any idea i mean we yeah. haven't gotten past step one yet so yeah. i'm thinking that yeah. that's just <laughs> but what we do know is that uh they pay 50 dollars a ton for that for sand to re restore other beaches in hawaii right so right. if you consider that there's hundreds of thousands of tons of sand in there there is a there that that could be some money that either you don't yeah, have, have to no pay idea. for another project right by like you know you don't have to like oh we're gonna you know, get a bunch of sand from somewhere for some other restoration somewhere else or what have you or you know or there's some way to to make use of it without that's that's still one big open ended question that we we'll have to, have to wait and see but there is value to the thing it's just worth mentioning that rather than right. just dumping it out. I'd assume there's some bureaucratic hurdle because there normally is. <laughs> To being able to do it's too efficient philip for the government my, my, the hurdle <laughs> might be in my mind the actual planners being able to write the plan and include that long-term provision which is not something we've seen any evidence from any humans thus far mm -hmm. right and you know not to be too harsh right. but like it's been friggin four years to get to the point to, to, to we're gonna do with the first thing we suggested four years ago that's ridiculous yep but frustrating hey, we're, <laughs> yep we're getting there um so yeah that's po wiki um we will let you know what the probably the next update would be at the end of the month when the report comes out um don't hold your breath for that report being anything special though um but it will come out and that will be the the guide guiding uh, framework moving forward you know by we're what we're working out of um, once that thing's produced so Hopefully they get everything right in it. I mean, it was probably good that they went to the community and got all the feedback that they did, but, you know, here we are. Yeah, much better than actually releasing a report as it was, which would have been a disaster. <laughs> right. All right. Well, that, I think, sums it up for me. Um, we did have, actually, we did have one question. Uh, um, oh, did I miss it? Oh, no. Let's see if I can find this thing real quick. I believe oh, it was about the magnitude 7.6 down by Papua New Guinea. And if that impacted uh, us here and uh, mentioned the Helena slump, I think that's close enough. I can't find the question right now, but I think that's the gist of it. So uh, no impact. It is detectable. I mean, that, those earthquake, big earthquakes send out energy waves that are detectable globally so certainly our very sensitive seismometer has picked it up right and so 
it did move the ground some small amount, but probably on the same scale as other forces around are actually pushing it, right? So right. if any rock was teetering on its edge and ready to go and fall over, if any fault was about ready to pop and, you know, including healing a slump, which is just in the end, plain old fault, um, then maybe that could have been the, the, the thing that pushed it over the edge. But if it wasn't that, it could have been the tides or it could have been, you know, like any number of these, any of these numbers of smaller forces that are not um, earth moving forces naturally by themselves, but enough to push the boulder over the edge, so to speak. Right. And then once it does, it can kind of start rolling on its own and set off some other process, for example. But um, yeah, we haven't talked about healing, healing a slump in a long time, um, but that's something that you're, you really be looking for more of Kilauea's south flank movement. So changes within Kilauea's magma system, changes within the southwest rift, Mauna Loa's area, like that, all of that's what, we're, what we have to be looking at more so as the larger forces that can be applied from closer by by large, larger systems of volcanoes. That's, that's basically it. Yeah. No, Detectable, right. but no impact. Oh, yeah, good question. So I think, yeah, I think that'll do it for us this week. Um, we will be back next week at our standard time, 5 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. And unless something happens, you know, we're always ready for something to happen, but we don't really expect anything right now. If it does, though, we will go live with a special presentation at uh, that moment. But yeah, unless something does happen, we will see you next week. Back here, same time, same place. Uh, make sure you leave a like and a subscription. Definitely helps the channel out. And until next week, aloha. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah, and uh, due to our new funding, we are going to be putting out more more short videos as well. So to make sure you catch those as well, make sure you are subscribed to, and we're going to try, try to give you guys that, that maybe want a quick recap or want to share something with someone that doesn't want to watch our full two hours 50 minutes stream as we are right now that we can have some alternatives there like like little short versions so we'll start doing those as well and for sure subscribe so thank you guys um thank you guys all for sharing your time with us for donating and supporting us in all the other ways like that you have been we appreciate it and we'll see you guys all next week so from hawaii tracker he's dan DePont and philip ong aloha everyone <laughs>